pleasure this afternoon to introduce two of our favorite students from NASCAD and they're seated behind me. Um, Annabelle Biro, graduate, she's sitting on your right. Annabelle Biro is um, graduating with her BFA in ceramics from NASCAD and Vanessa Vaughn uh, on our left is a cross-discipline artist um, doing her post-MFA studies at NASCAD University. Today they'll be discussing contemporary pluralistic ceramic art practices and making a case and for um, an early exposure to critical writing and the application of critical principles within ceramic education. Vanessa is an artist working um, across disciplines, sculpture, performance, video animation, and uh, that work will manifest as installations, performances, public interventions, and things that really develop uh, uh, collective memories and themes of transformation um, are the, the kind of uh, uh, things that she is pursuing in her own work. Vanessa is involved in two artist collectives and they employ stories, personas, dance, and uh, developing ideas about emotional states. She's been an artist in residence in Finland as one an emerging artist uh, fellowship the Scottish Sculpture Workshop Residency. He's exhibited in San Francisco at the Art Commission Gallery and performances in Amsterdam. She's been published and um, her work has been reviewed in the Huffington Post, the CBC News in Canada, um, and a number of other um, excellent magazines. She has an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, and she lives uh, between Halifax, where, where I live, and Montreal, and she's been teaching part-time as well, as well as studying with us at NASCAD uh, Ceramics Department. Annabelle uh, was born and raised in London, Ontario. She's a, a young artist uh, currently pursuing her BFA degree at NASCAD University. And she's this close to getting her degree. She has a major in ceramics and a minor in art history. And she lives, um, um, as I say, works in um, Halifax, Nova Scotia. During her time at NASCAD, she's received the uh, David uh, Smith Creative Innovators of Tomorrow Scholarship. She's won a Medalta Student Residency Award and she's a finalist for our prestigious Starfish Award um, this coming year. So without further ado, I pass this over to uh, Annabelle and Vanessa Vaughn. Thank you, Neil. That was very kind. So welcome, everyone. I'm Vanessa. This is my partner, Annabelle. Uh, thank you very much for attending. We have a pretty text-heavy presentation, so just a warning, get ready. Um, without further ado, we'll get going. Showing? Why is it not mm. showing? That's weird. Okay, well, we have a technical issue here, but contemporary ceramic practices, I'm going to read the quote. There should be a quote up there by Glenn R. Brown. Uh, and he states, the pluralism attained by contemporary ceramics is an extraordinary achievement that ought to be savored, not impeded. Unless, of course, one finds restrictions on thought, a narrowing of practice, an obsession with a finite set of essentialist principles to be characteristics worth cultivating for the future of ceramics. This is a fairly cheeky comment by Glenn R. Brown, uh, but it really emphasizes how we feel about criticism in ceramics and its need to adapt and evolve to these pluralistic approaches. Applying formal principles to critique in contemporary ceramics is less relevant in light of these broader uh, practices. So for the purposes of this presentation, we are going to discuss the need for criticism in education as it applies to pluralistic contemporary ceramic practices. We do believe it's important for all ceramic practices, including utilitarian forms. Uh, however, most of our research today focuses mainly on these pluralistic practices within ceramics. If students who have a contemporary ceramic art practice are exposed to critical writing and learn how to value critique through many lenses, we believe it will result in an enriched artist who value dialogue across all disciplines and are engaged with many communities. This is our thesis statement, which outlines our belief that exposing students early on in their careers to a variety of critical writing will result in a more robust artist community that is open and accessible. So here's an artist, Marina Kuczynski, who is a great example of an artist who is working across disciplines between ceramics and installation. 
Her work investigates the relationship between physical presence and physical space. Location is questioned in relation to cultural, institutional, and psychological con contexts. So in order to, dis to discuss work like this, it is important to understand not only how ceramics and clay operates, but also how sculptural work that is charged through space is an, in an installation adds to the content. The viewer is challenged to not only evaluate objects and material, but also to navigate the space and setting as well. Whether that's a cultural, and as the context, whether that's a cultural, institutional, or psychological, psychological critique. This requires more than just knowledge of material, material and process. We have to ask this work another set of questions that are outside of our ceramic medium background, such as how do we tell a story through space? So that brings us to the next slide, which really says, well, what is criticism? Um, on the top, the first definition is from the Oxford English Dictionary, and it uses terms such as judgment, merits, faults, as though there is one criteria to evaluate artwork. Indeed, there used to be very clear criteria when evaluating artwork from the critic's point of view. Think of Adorno, Greenberg, and the like. But in contemporary context, uh, a rigid framework of checks and balances is really less appropriate. So we made our own definition. Um, so I'll just read it. Number two, the activity of the discussion and interpretation of art and its value. In the contemporary view, it is useful to use a variety of lenses to analyze and evaluate artworks rather than rely on a universal paradigm. Uh, so because there is such a diversity of practices within contemporary ceramics, it's really difficult to have one universal formula um, to evaluate artworks with. Uh, as, and as much as critics really struggle with diversity of practice because there is no grand narrative to work with, um, they also acknowledge that the ability to view multiple sites from many positions, known as the comparative model, um, referenced by Okeke Gulu, will sufficiently help us, and we should value the richness and substance that a diversity of practice brings. So moving on, we've broken down into the multiple lenses of criticism. These are just some of the lenses we can look through to evaluate artworks. Obviously, there are many more than what is listed here. Um, however, this is just to point out some of the most common lenses that are used within art criticism. And I'm just gonna go through them briefly just to refresh our memories on what we're talking about. So we'll start with modernism at the bottom. So modernism's underlying principles, basically a rejection of history and representation, innovation with form and color, an emphasis on materials, techniques, and processes, and it was formulated by Clement Greenberg. Then we move into an art historical lens. That's the study of objects and art in their historical development and stylistic contexts. Uh, it also considers aesthetics as well, but basically the, it examines the work uh, in the context of its time frame. Uh, then we move on to post-colonial theory. It's referring to art produced in response to the aftermath of a colonial rule. It usually addresses issues of national and cultural identity, race, and ethnicity. It analyzes and responds to the cultural legacies of colonialism and the human consequences of controlling a country in order to exploit the native people of the land. Then we move into material specific. So according to Clement Greenberg, who helped popularize this term, medium specificity holds that the unique and proper area of competence for a form of art corresponds with the ability of an artist to manipulate those features that are unique to the nature of a particular medium. We find that this lens is used most commonly when evaluating ceramics, both in critical writing and in studio critique. Um, then we move into aesthetic philosophy. This encompasses many branches, so I'm not gonna get into all of them, but just to remind you, the first of which was developed by Kant, and it really discusses the idea of uh, pure beauty, art for art's sake, um, not really valuing um, practical or moral or narr narrative considerations, just championing art for pure beauty. Um, but more recently within that philosophy, there's been many other aesthetic philosophies around art that are more concerned with the fundamental nature of what art really is. Um, so think of relational aesthetics here, 
um, which is really talking about, well, what is the experience of art? Uh, then we move into contemporary theory, which encourages creative, holistic, and practical knowledge of the field. Um, it's grounded in practical schooling within criticism, art writing, and curating. And it's using the knowledge of many histories and theories. So being contemporary to us means engaging in multiple perspectives and different ways of learning and seeing. Then we get into postmodernism. It's anti-authoritarian by its nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. It refuses to recognize the authority of any single style or definition, and it collapses the distinction between high culture and mass or popular culture. Uh, it tends to get rid of the boundary between everyday uh, life as well as art. Lastly, we have the feminist lens. So feminist lens ex is exploring gender-related experiences within society, often with the aim to expose embedded inequalities and show alternatives to dominant gender roles. So we believe in order to strengthen um, a, a useful and meaningful critical discourse within ceramics, it is really important to educate students to use many lenses when they're evaluating works. It is our experience the most commonly used lens is the material-specific lens, and it's often the only lens when evaluating ceramic works. At the Critical Santa Fe Symposium, Paul Matu broke down the steps of good criticism into a number of questions we can ask ourselves in order to guide our evaluation of artworks. The first step being describe. What do you see and try not to state the obvious, rather look for qualities that might escape the casual observer. Only describe what is essential using whatever lenses are appropriate. Going on to contextualize. When, when where, and how does the, operate, the work operate? Who is it speaking to, and what are its connections to history, and whose history? How does it connect to itself and any other appropriate arts or other experiences? This step may take several lenses, some more useful than others, but it will inform you on how to analyze in the next step. Sorry, I'm going to turn the mic here. Uh, number three, we move into the analyzation stage. So in this step, we're really asking ourselves, what is the work really about? Uh, and in this step, you may choose many lenses that might seem appropriate for whatever the content it is that you're discussing. Um, for example, just to give a well-known example, if I was to evaluate the work of the Guerrilla Girls, I would choose a feminist lens in addition to an art historical lens and a postmodernist lens. This would give me a much more well-rounded analysis and help me to understand what the work is about on more than one level. Finally, you move to the evaluation stage um, and you have to ask yourself, well, is this work of good quality? Now, what that means is it's not about personal taste. We, we really need to review our previous steps here and go back to our lenses and decide, well, does this uh, work deliver on what it promises or intends? So in other words, if it was the Guerrilla Girls we were evaluating, does the work expose gender bias in an art historical context? Does it deliver a meaningful critique on the content and disregard sets of rules for all art? Some more general questions we can ask in this stage are, what are the work's strengths and weaknesses? How could it be improved? What aspects of the work are or aren't sufficiently uh, resolved? These multiple lenses will give us more comprehensive evaluation than using only a common lens that is uh, material specific in ceramics. So on this slide, we have Aweiwei's colored vases and dropping the Han Dynasty urn. We are showing these two famous Ai Weiwei pieces in order to set the stage for two fairly recent reviews of exhibitions that showed this work. Although the two shows were at different times in different cities, they did encompass the same themes and concepts with much of the same works displayed. So starting on the left side, we have Leopold Kalowick's review of the 2014 exhibition entitled Ai Weiwei, According to What? at the AGO in Toronto. Kowalik approaches his review of Ai Weiwei with only a material lens that expects Weiwei to exalt craft and material as well as craftsmanship over any conceptual meaning and seems to dismiss any symbolic gesture the material has toward meaning. I'd like to read a quote from Kowalik's article. There is a similar disappointment with He Zhi, which consists of 3,000 porcelain crabs in a heap on the floor. 
Any qualities or references embodied in the handmade completely vanish beneath the thought that if the crabs had been cheap plastic toys that were made in China, the point might have been similarly or more deftly made, end quote. He does not seem to understand that the made in China porcelain crabs that are displayed in a pile as though they are cheap plastic toys are intentionally displayed this way to in fact discredit the handmade aspects and high value Westerners place on porcelain since they are politically political commentary on Chinese labor. If they really were plastic toys, this would be a very literal and would not convey the message that there they are humans involved in the labor. Something porcelain conveys to a Western audience, but certainly not plastic toys. We would think factory, not human. Okay, so now we'll move to the right side. Um, I'm gonna look at an article that Adam Welch reviews, uh, the 2011 exhibition entitled Ai Weiwei Dropping the Urn, Ceramic Works 5000 BCE to 2010 CE uh, at, at Arcadia University Gallery in Philadelphia. Uh, so Welch approaches his review of Ai Weiwei using um, a multiple lensed approach. Uh, he recognizes the layers of critique of cultural constructs, history, tradition, and authenticity that Ai Weiwei makes. So here I'll read a quote from his review. He states, in all of his works, destruction is liberation. The, through the obliteration of ceramic objects, as well as the authority of culturally constructed identity, Weiwei establishes new meaning. Still, the work is vested both within the metaphorical and physical fragility of ceramics, in addition to its relationship with those constructed identities. The real conceptual brilliance of these works is the critique of the authenticity of history, tradition, and originality, while simultaneously relying on these same constructs for meaning and effect." End quote. So it's clear here that Adam Welch uh, uses a, uh, the comparative model to critically analyze Ai Weiwei's work. He's using many lenses, and not only does he use the obvious material lens where he talks about the fragility of the ceramics, um, but he's also using the post-colonial lens, the contemporary theory lens, the art historical lens, and the art philosophical lenses. He recognizes the deep conceptual brilliance of the work and how cleverly Weiwei utilizes Western constructs uh, to both inform and deconstruct a variety of identities. <clears throat> so in conclusion, we can see that Welch makes a more comprehensive evaluation because he's reading the work on so many levels and looking through so many lenses <clears throat> using the comparative model. Whereas Cowlick is leaving us with a very one-dimensional, narrow perspective, and in my mind, a very incomplete evaluation. So then we move on to, well, what is criticism's value for ceramics? Well, according to Welch, it's gonna promote and progress the field, it's gonna challenge paradigms, it's gonna encourage diversity in practice, and connect people. And Welch really emphasizes the importance of connecting ceramics with the wider arts community at large because he really feels that um, the opportunity to exchange ideas and create dialogues is very, very important for ceramics, especially within criticism. So during the Critical Santa Fe Symposium, uh, he's, he stated that another criticism is that the invited art critics have done little for ceramics within the art world. Indeed, even this is subject to debate and worthy of consideration. Be that as it may, the intention is not to lend credibility to the field, but to open up the conversation to people who practice and teach criticism. It would be naive to expect that we must reinvent criticism from the ground up, discarding every experience that defines the discipline today. Bringing luminaries from outside the field will broaden our horizon of understanding. These critics contributed to the texts that have shaped the post-1945 thinking of many ceramic practitioners. Without their involvement, the conversation remains insular." End quote. So obviously, according to Welch, it's really necessary to evaluate contemporary ceramics um, by understanding the other languages as well, the languages of sculpture, installation, performance, and any other vocabularies that artists choose to employ in addition to the material and process of ceramics. So here we have work by Emma Hart, and it was installed in an abandoned hotel in London in 2015. 
And Hart is a great example of a ceramics artist who utilizes the vocabulary of sculpture and installation, making site-specific considerations and working across disciplines. In order to critically evaluate this work, it is necessary to draw upon the knowledge of those disciplines and the theory around these arts to extrapolate meaning and substance. Ignoring or isolating ourselves as a field within criticism is limiting both for artists, edu educators, students, and the world at large. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can use the available resources, our multiple lenses, and focus on opening up the field instead of thinking medium overrides any other type of content. We can benefit from learning and understanding a variety of points of views while still maintaining a rich ceramics history. A diversity of voices creates a better and more engaging critical evaluation. Okay, so next we move on to, well, what does this mean for ceramics education as a whole? And on the board, you see some quotes from Olivia Good, who's done a lot of research within uh, ceramics, uh, within art education in the 21st century, uh, specifically tackling pluralistic art practices. Um, so she really discusses the need for change within education to address the pluralistic art practices that we see today. Um, in ceramics, the formal elements used for evaluation of student works, such as color, surface, process technique, clay body, and other technical concerns, while all of those are still very important, and of course students do choose those on purpose for a reason, so they are important, we do need to consider them, but they shouldn't be the only basis for judging whether a work is successful or unsuccessful. Good believes that the foundation of art education should identify and focus on meaningful, ethical, and intellectual and critical principles. Um, Olivia Good states, responsibly introducing students to today's discursive practices in art history, aesthetics, and art criticism means introducing them to the analytical procedures of the field of visual culture. Such context-based methodologies build an awareness of the environment within which the images or artifacts were made, an important aspect of introducing the art of other cultures into the curriculum." End quote. So with this in mind, um, it would be very practical and useful to build these foundations earlier on in the ceramics education and integrate these discursive principles into the ceramics studio courses. We all know that students are taking art history, they're taking visual culture, um, and they're taking theory courses on the side, outside of their ceramics education. But I think sometimes these things get very separated. So if students were able to practically apply a lot of these, uh, what they've learned, a lot of these theories in their ceramics studio critiques, um, through writing assignments, through presentations, through exhibition reviews, um, they will become more confident in interpreting a wider range of artworks um, and they will become better makers themselves. So. Studio critiques are the foundation for criticism, and the foundation for criticism should provide examples of appropriate critique. For many ceramic students, the studio critique is their first real-world application of criticism. It should critique combining disciplines, by diversifying critiques into many formats with mixed dif disciplines, students gain exposure and confidence to practice with their peers on a regular basis. It should reference current contemporary artists, not just sh showing ceramic artists, but showing artists with a broad range of practices. It should encourage discussion of conceptual framework, emphasis on many types of research, not just the usual ceramic technical research, but also research that into their own conceptual ideas. It should require a man mandatory participation. Participation is key. We must have every student participate. It, not, it should not be acceptable to remain quiet during the critiques. And through participation, students will get, gain confidence. It should emphasize the value of a critical feedback loop. <coughs> Constructive criticism should be valued. Often young students feel to criticize is to be negative, but in the arts, constructive feedback even if it's describing things that are lacking, are extremely helpful to the artist and should be viewed positively. And it should expose students to a variety of styles of critique. Introduce written critique, presentations, as well as walkthroughs. With a foundation of understanding multiple lenses, using the comparative model, students will be able to interpret more work more competently.
Whoops. Go back. <laughs> this is not working for me. Okay. There we go. Okay, so uh, we want to show an example of a, a student's work. Um, this is a student named Habiba El Sayed, and this is her piece. It's entitled Weight of Apology. And she created this piece as a senior student for her final show at NASCAD in 2016. Um, the reason we're showing the piece is because she's chosen in this piece to operate across many disciplines. So she's using performance, sound, sculpture, and clay. And it was a week-long durational piece that evolved over a period of time. So the, in this photo, you can see this is sort of the beginning of the week, uh, where the structure is quite small. Here's a detail shot, and you can see that the clay she's using is unfired. It's raw clay in the gallery. And this is towards the end of the week. Um, as the structure's collapsing, she's building onto it as it's collapsing. In the next uh, slide, we're going to show a one-minute video clip of the performance, just to give you an idea of what it was. But I just want to issue a little warning. Uh, the audio may be sensitive to some viewers because it's using audio from the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the United States. This just in, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. The CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. You can see these pictures. It's obviously uh, something devastating has happened. It's a plane that appeared to be cruising uh, slightly lower than normal at altitude over it appears to have crashed into, uh, I don't know which tower it is, but it hit directly in the middle of uh, one of the World Trade Center towers. Sean, what kind of plane? Was it a small plane, a, a it jet? Was a, uh, it was a jet. It uh, looked like a two-engine jet, um, maybe a seven. Okay, so just to set the stage there, the performance was ongoing over a week, and that was the audio that was playing, and it was meant to be very disruptive. It was very loud, and the audio changed volumes depending on what stage she was within the performance. El Sayed's work requires a variety of lenses to properly evaluate. Students in ceramics are more diverse today than ever before and will continue to explore complex themes such as identity, race, sexuality, political and social commentary in their work. Without a solid foundation of these discursive principles of analysis, students lack the necessary tool set to gain meaningful insight and properly evaluate the work. It would be beneficial to have studio critiques with other disciplines, in this case, performance, sound, and video, to highlight the importance of durational work that utilizes the body. Having mixed critiques benefits both the artist and the stu student studio group, critique group, because they can access other knowledge bases. Right, so if in Habiba's case, there had been a, a mixture of disciplines within her studio group, they might have been able to give commentary on a number of different aspects that the ceramic students may not have known or picked up on. A lot of things in, that are relevant within the history performance, using the body, the durational uh, nature of the work, um, as well as using sound to disrupt space. These were all things that could have added to the discussion in her case, and I think would have benefited um, the artist herself so that she could get more valuable feedback from her student peers. Um, not only does El Sayed address the literal weight of apology with the collapsing of the sculptural wall, but also metaphorically through the laborious process of building and rebuilding over a one-week period. She addresses gender bias, uh, both in the Muslim context and the Canadian context, which cleverly points to the importance of women's work in constantly maintaining relationships within families, communities, and society at large. It was clear by the end of the week that the weight was too great to bear and the wall would never stand tall. This was evident by the shrinking and drying and cracking of the clay. 
that disintegrated throughout the performance itself. And her choice of unfired clay was very intentional. She wanted to illustrate that she was building an apology on an extremely fragile base. She was also commenting on the state of Canadian society that as an ethnic minority, she felt an obligation to apologize on behalf of an entire community. So if we were using the comparative model with a group of students who were critiquing from many mixed disciplines, um, I, I believe that would have strengthened the conversations and the feedback given to the student. It is our opinion that these complexity Complexities were not understood or addressed properly in our final studio critique group. As a result, the content and the conceptual framework in this piece was not properly valued by the group of students. As a student, it's important that the university community attempts to access artwork with a multiple lens approach, because otherwise we risk alienating artists who would enrich the ceramics community. We need to value the research involved that leads to the conceptual framework just as highly as the material components. So this leads us into the next piece, um, which is why some artists, particularly ceramic installation artists, um, are making a case for separation and making a case for a self-definition uh, within ceramics criticism. Um, so here I have a quote by Ruth Chambers up on the board, and she's kind of examining this. She says, unraveling the theoretical ambiguities of the combination of ceramics as rooted in medium-specific pre-industrial and craft traditions and installation as inherently postmodern and content-based rather than material-based remains a challenge. Similarly, viewing ceramic installation as a differentiated practice with delineated parameters has drawbacks as it potentially diminishes the opportunities an ambiguous position presents for further expanded study. So she's really on the fence here. Um, she understands that it might be useful to have a self-defining critique um, to address some of these concerns, but she also doesn't want to feel isolated or close off the field. Um, so she's really frustrated um, with why it would be appropriate and whether it should be appropriate. Um, and this is because a lot of the ceramic uh, analysis focuses on material and process um, as the most important lens, as we illustrated before. Now, this might be appropriate for some installation works, and certainly Edmund DeWall makes a great case for that. Um, but it doesn't address pluralistic practices, practices in ceramics that cross many di disciplines. So it's important to note that valid criticism for these works would also require a deeper understanding of installation theory, um, looking into some of the research that Claire Bishop has done um, and what it means to transform whole spaces or uh, bring ideas forth within an entire space. So we think separation would only divide us more um, if we were to just apply a multiple lens approach using the comparative model uh, to ceramics criticism, then a self-definition isn't necessary. So here's some work by the artist Megan Smythe who operates across disciplines. She uses resin, ceramics, and installation Again, is it really necessary to create a self-defining criticism to address this work? Can we not draw on the many lenses we already have access to? And why not strive as a field to have a diverse and multi-layered critical dialogue? So here, we're gonna show the work of Rory McDonald, who's actually a professor at NASCAD and a friend of Neil's. Um, we think multiple lenses would help us evaluate the work of Rory McDonald because he's taking traditional craft practices out of their original contexts. So not only does he spark a discourse around ceramics and craft history, um, but he also challenges our notions of what public art means um, and interventions by situating himself as public craft, which is a term he coined. So instead of focusing on hierarchies, he completely circumvents that by placing himself outside the usual audience, outside traditional spaces such as the gallery or the museum. He invigorates the agency of craft in a new context and he invites active participation. 
Although the work reflects strongly in a ceramics and craft lens, and it is very necessary to understand those histories in order to properly evaluate it, it also requires an understanding of a variety of other lenses, uh, those within social, uh, econ economic, art historic, performative, and many other lenses within public spaces. It's a very simple gesture, but it's very complex because it raises several other questions outside of the ceramics and craft histories. What does it mean to repair a curb? Uh, what, is it, what happens to the community? How do they interact with this? What do they do when they see this as they come out of their houses or walk down the street? So these are just uh, to name a few of the other considerations that he raises. So we think it's very clever work because he raises so many questions. So we'd like to offer uh, some valuable resources that we think are useful when it comes to criticism uh, in general and in ceramics education. So first we have JAR, the Journal of Artistic Research. And this is an open source uh, peer-reviewed journal, uh, but it, it, and it accepts research and critical writing in any art discipline. But what's really interesting about this uh, platform is that you do not have to be affiliated with a university or an institution to submit your research or your papers. Um, now, most of the journals that we as students would come in contact with are usually peer reviewed, but they're usually written by people who are affiliated with academic institutions. Um, so the, the fact that this is open to anyone, regardless of where they are from, uh, regardless of whether they could afford a master's degree or a doctorate, anywhere in the world, anyone could submit, and it's still peer-reviewed, so there's still a rigorous process. It's not any content goes, but it allows for more voices to be heard, voices outside of academia that might not have been heard, um, and it's going to open up the field. It also allows for visual essays, so there are opportunities for artists who might not want to write papers, um, who might want to research a certain topic visually. They can submit multimedia, such as images and videos, interactive th installations, things like that. Um, and it's completely free. It's open and online and completely free. Uh, the next one is eFlux. It's also free. And this journal can be downloaded onto any mobile device. Um, basically, it features a lot of contributions from a wide variety of artists, curators, writers, and academics. And it looks at contemporary works through a wide variety of lenses, and it also does focus on some art historical projects as well. So it provides a lot of different perspectives for readers. Then we have the well-known C file, which is a great resource for ceramics specifically. It features articles by a variety of contributors and often showcases new technologies in the field. It has good resources to innovative ideas in clay focusing in visual art design and architecture. So some conclusions that we can make. Um, we, we do feel more exposure to criticism at an earlier stage in ceramics education would be beneficial, particularly using the comparative model with the multiple lensed approach. We think it will shape a much more meaningful critical discourse, not only in education, but also in the future. Uh, it will prepare students for a career within the arts. It will allow students to value the critical feedback loop very highly. It will also promote a diverse student body and faculty because now we're opening up the dialogue between many fields and disciplines and many voices. And overall, we feel it will result in better artists over time. And in conclusion, we feel that ceramics education can create a stronger foundation for students by exposing them to critical writing and critical feedback that utilizes a variety of lenses. As the field progresses, it's important to provide students with the right tools to navigate a pluralistic art practice. So presently, in our experience, we feel like there is lots, lots of room for improvement in this domain. So a lot of our, the concerns that we've addressed um, 
are not always taken on as a required curriculum within ceramics. Instead, they depend on the individual professors that run your courses. And usually we see it in a senior, senior years only. We don't see it in the earlier intro stages. Um, so we'd like to see it at those intro stages, getting students who are taking the art history, the visual culture, all those other courses to start applying some of those ideas and theories that they've been learning about in their ceramic studio. Even very simple things, you can incorporate it into critiques even if it's a skill building class. Um, you can have students talk about uh, other works of art from a variety of different perspectives. You can have them go to museums or exhibitions and write short reviews. You can have them read about the current exhibitions in your cities and, and see if they can evaluate what they make of the critics that write about it. Um, so it's, uh, we feel it's not quite enough to just take these other courses as a separate thing and then expect that those connections will be made on their own. They are made, of course, in senior years, and professors really do instill that. But at an earlier stage in, in the ceramics education, it would be more beneficial because by the time the student reaches the senior year, they feel more confident, they feel like they know the material, they feel like they're used to you know, all these theories, and they can really um, go ahead and, and participate and be active participants. Um, they can also engage in uh, more than just technical research. They can do lots of conceptual research within their idea base, what it is they're pursuing or investigating. Um, we think that uh, students who are encouraged to explore a lot of diverse methods and engaging in all these content-based research uh, would really be opening up a lot of different perspectives. So changing things earlier in the ceramics education means that the future will progress, and that is the theme of this year's conference, Future Flux. So if we want the future to progress, we need to change things now. Um, criticism has the power to shape the dialogue and the content of the future. So students should really be encouraged to participate, to be active participants in that. They can shape things. So that, that's the end of our talk. Thank you very much for attending. We're sorry it's very text heavy, but hopefully you bear with us. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to discuss anything further, let us know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's a tough question. <clears throat> um, well, I think what I find useful, especially when students don't have a lot of experience, like often examples are a great way. So like, I don't know how you structure your intro classes, but having um, maybe a quick slide talk and just showing a couple of examples, like, hey, this is you know a feminist perspective on this. This is a piece that uses performance and these are some considerations that we should look at. And sometimes just generating a bit of class discussion around that. Um, it makes students see the example so they kind of make the connection of what it is you're talking about and then generates opportunities for discussion. Uh, yep.
been harnessed, fortunately, unless you've been written yet. And mm-hmm. I hope that um, the schools will help consider helping to solve this problem. I think it's a breeding ground that will take home. I, I'm, I feel pretty frantic about it myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, totally. Yeah, I mean, that's what these two do because they're free and online. So JAR uh, and Eflux are both free and online. So you can read about contemporary practices. But as far as ceramics specific goes, you really have to look at the ceramics journals like Ceramics, Art and Perception and um, yeah, all that stuff. But like if... if uh, I think you're totally right. I think that um, having an online presence that's maybe connecting universities across uh, North America would be a really great platform because then students and educators would have access. It's just a question of how to do that and, and who are those people who are, who are doing that. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be great. And it'd be a great resource for everyone as well. And there's lots of really interesting uh, younger uh, critics who are writing in criticism and probably don't have the venue, you know? So that would be a nice uh, way to connect people. Yes? Um, I'm from Yon Park Gallery in the UK. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Welcome anyone from America, students, and uh, um, American students to write for us. But what I do is I try and encourage ceramic students in the UK to um, critically write about their peers' work, but also work in galleries and museums and submit that to us. And we will put that on, online on our website and retweet it on Facebook and things like that. Just to get practice in writing and mm. Yeah, absolutely. I actually got to visit your gallery this summer. Uh, so I saw the the Center for Ceramics. And it was awesome. And yeah, I didn't know that you did that on the web, though. But yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> but just Google Center of Ceramic Art York Art Gallery in the UK and it'll come up and it's a great uh, center. I really liked it this summer. It was fantastic. Yep. I don't know how big your response panel has up there will be, but um, you were, were you asking about uh, Ceramic Art Gallery in Ireland? Yeah. Yeah, I Your class, you submit a, a one-page review of a shelf 
on the exhibit. And you were also required to like have a one paragraph response to a professional art critic review. And so whether you were, you know, you could be a physical education major, you were still required to read this as part of like a first semester class and just say, oh, I didn't get it. That could be your response, but like you didn't talk about that. Um, and then later in the class, you were required to submit your own review. And it, it was different because it wasn't Sam specific, but doing something like that where you don't, you, there's no way out, you have to, even if you're reading it, maybe, <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. And it's, it's challenging for those of us who do and, and maybe don't do this. Can you do that? I can't hear anything. OK. <laughs> those that have the power, i.e. me, who mm -hmm. have faculty, um, administration. We, we have entrenched cultures, yeah. you know, that are uh, they're generational. Um, they move and fix and develop certain things well. Uh, if you were to have listened to his speaker last night, I think the things he said would, would actually work against what you're saying, some of them. Um, so, sort of pointing him out as a generational thinker. Mm -hmm. you know? So you have to convince this other generation, perhaps mine, mm -hmm. about how to do it. So I'm just wanting to give him a thought for that. And, and another question that I would have that I think is part of it is what is the student, you know, what is the responsibilities of students within the critical framework? Because yeah. in a sense, it's what, you know, I think um, modern art schools uh, or contemporary art schools all have forum mm -hmm. it's available and essential but you're talking about all the kind of shaping components in there but what do you think student responsibility is yeah that's a good question because students need to take responsibility so you know that's something that I often see is that students don't read, um, which I don't understand. I mean, if you want to be good at something, you should be reading about it. Like, you don't see a musician who doesn't listen to music. You don't see a writer who doesn't read books. So if you're an artist, you should be looking at art and reading about it. To me, that's common sense. But I think a lot of younger students um, you know, maybe their maturity level is a different at a different stage. And so that's kind of why I was saying in an earlier framework, you kind of have to enforce it because they're not doing it on their own. Um, and I know that's really difficult to implement. Um, i'm I'm understanding that it's not something that happens overnight or there's some clear method. Um, but there are different ways of introducing topics and different lenses and points of view within projects or within discussions. Um, and I think it probably def uh, really depends on each department and each professor's uh, style. Um, but I think uh, just what we were pointing out was that it's, it's really great that it's happening in the senior levels, but we just see the younger students um, who don't have that knowledge. And so it's sort of in a, in a mixed critique where you might have studio ones with studio fours, it can be a pretty banal critique when only half the students are talking and participating because only half feel confident or have the knowledge base um, or have something to say and the other half are not participating. So I think, I think maybe it's just a way to address those those things, um, but it is challenging. I don't know what 
what would you say? Yeah, just encouraging participation and make incorporating it into assignments as like best as you can, really. Uh, like the earlier, the better. And, and will you present this to us? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, for example, you do a great job of it at the senior level, I, and I know that it's more challenging for your intro classes. Um, and uh, of course, we're not present when you're teaching your intro classes, but we, we see some of the results, like some of the er Studio One people that come into the senior levels, and like I said, they're not talking at all. Oh. Sure. <laughs> if you'd like us to, sure. Yeah. Because I think you know you've got you know these are perhaps the next crop of professors out here. But I think also getting well there by yeah by the the student unions, you know what. Yeah, and it definitely interests me, and I also am very interested in art theory, and I come from a fine arts background, not ceramics, so I already was very versed in that, but um, other than, uh, aside from that, I think like students themselves, like they need to feel like they can participate, and, and so it's also giving them like a tool set to kind of feel confident and feel like, hey, I can, I can expose myself to all these different writings, I can go and see these shows, and I can read the reviews, and I might have something interesting to say, because that's actually what's gonna shape the future. Um, it's, it's really encouraging the future crop and the next generations to be more critical thinkers, to be thoughtful people, and I think most artists are already, or they inherently have that, in them, but it's just about coaxing that out of them to really think deeply about things on many levels. Yep. Yeah, like we were saying, um, having a, a variety of styles of critique. So one style might be they present their work and give a short talk and then students critique. Another style might be that they don't talk at all and students do a walkthrough and then react to it. And another one might be a written critique um, so, yeah, and I think the, the act of practicing all of these types regularly will also give the artist more confidence to speak about their work. But yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I've noticed in ceramics often that when I ask someone that what, a, what their work is about, they start telling me about the process and how they made it. And I'm like, yeah, but what is it about? <laughs> um, I know that you made it with ceramics and you know, I don't need to know every aspect of that. I just wanna know what, what the work is about. So maybe yeah, just practicing uh, many styles and getting the confidence. Yeah, uh, sorry, there's shoes at the back first. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and finally, one of the things that we do at our gallery is we always prepare a show and then sit with the artist to have spend an hour or two with us as staff and walk the show and come to the um, walkthrough and take in the questions that our clients are going to ask. And we, you know, we you know, glean that information. Um, and they, while we may come feel comfortable, they also want to share their stories, and that makes us better on the floor for them. So it has to be. We just have uh, time for one more, and then I think we have to go. Yes. I'm a professor of art and design at Tucson Community College, so all of the young people are here. But there is an organization of, it's, it's a nationwide conference that takes place on the East Coast. Uh, the state has a foundation uh, program. Uh, I don't know what the, yeah, what the Latin stands for, foundation art. Oh, Oh, cool. Right, good, thank you. Art Foundation Art Theory and Education. And we've been having a regional meeting for a couple of years about the heat and about, and it's all foundation classes. So it's about the exact issues that we're talking about right now. How do we get young students, new students, unsure students to be able to talk about their work, to be able to be articulate about their work, to understand what is going on. And the, if, if you are interested, yeah. There's a lot of discussion going on in that venue. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely look that up. Well, thank you very much for attending. I think we have to go. <laughs>